church, can we stand to our feet as we sing this morning? Good morning. My name is Amy Nichols, and I am so excited to be here with you this morning. I have to ask this question. How many of you got out yesterday outdoors in that sun? And just how many of you did like me and just stood there for a moment with your eyes closed like, thank you, God. I know, and I was reminded yesterday that it's during those dark and cold times that we learn to appreciate that sun shining upon us. And if you were um, out yesterday, you definitely felt that. 
If you are a guest with us today, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for joining us this morning. We want to welcome you, and I hope that you're finding yourself comfortable and enjoying your time with us so far. You know, everything that we do here, the songs we sing, even the announcements, the message, it all points to one thing, and that's for us to help people find and follow Jesus. And so I hope as we sing today that your heart and mind would be open, in, open to following and um, you know, chasing after him and drawing closer to him. And um, I'm gonna close and we're gonna sing another song and then I'll have some announcements and Pastor Michael's gonna bring the message today. Let's pray together. Father God, we are so grateful to be here together today. Thank you. Lord, like I said, we don't take it for granted. We have been through the times where we could not gather together. And so I don't take it for granted that we are gathered together in this building today. We are here, God, for you. We are here to worship you, to draw close to you, and to you know be in communion with each other and to uh, be able to seek after you together as a body of Christ. I thank you, Lord, for the time that we have to worship help our minds and hearts to be open to what you would be saying to us through your spirit. Help us to draw in, to set aside everything that would distract us, that we can just have our minds focused totally on you as we sing and as we worship together. We lift up this service, allow everything that we say and do be glorifying and praising to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
awesome to worship with you. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And that is the truth, what we sing, Lord. There is nothing, no one better than you. Nothing comes close, Lord Jesus. It is you who we are here for this morning. We are here to worship you, to love you, to pray to you, and to hear your scripture, Lord. To teach us something new about you this morning, Jesus. We long to know you better. It is in your powerful name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, if you're a guest with us today, we want you, oh yes, you can have a seat. <laughs> you looked like, like you were like, not sure if you wanted to sit down or not. Um, if you're a guest, guest with us today, we want to say welcome. And we would like to let, let you know a little bit about us. And we'd like to also get to know a little bit about you. So if you look in the back of the seat, there's, there's a pocket. And you'll find a brochure uh, that tells you a little about Riverside and what all we have going on and, and you know, we're all about. And also, there's an information card. And that information card is for you to fill out um, to let us know a little bit about yourself. And you can just drop that off um, in the bucket or on the Connection Center on your way out. Again, and we're so glad that you are joining us today. We also have an app. I think you probably have heard, heard about it 75,000 times by, by this point. But if you're new, maybe you haven't. So let me tell you, we have an app. Riverside app, and it allows you to follow along with the events and different things that are happening. Also, follow along with the message today, so you can pull that up. But I have two specific announcements that I am supposed to draw your attention to. The first one is next Sunday. Can you say next Sunday for me? Next Sunday. Good, thank you. Um, we are going to be having a new to know session. That is for specifically um, a time set aside for people who are new or newer to Riverside. And it's a time for you to get to meet some of the leaders, ask questions, get you know information, anything that you need. And that's gonna be taking place here next Sunday after both services. So it doesn't matter which service you attend, you can go right across the hall to room five after service and that time will be reserved for you. Now you can pre-register on the app or at the Connection Center or you can really just come on by. I'm positive they will not turn you away. So you're welcome to do that. Also, in two weeks, we are going to be having our annual business meeting. That did not sound like, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> I know it's a meeting, but I personally look forward to the time of reflecting on all that God has done over the last year and everything that's going on. And also, I like to see all the faces because with two locations and two times, there are so many people that I don't get a chance to see on a regular Sunday. So next two weeks from now, here at the Mills um, at 6 p.m., we will be having our annual business meeting. Um, if you are a member, you should begin to read those bios for the deacon nominations um, for the board and begin praying and asking God about that particular vote. You do not have to be a member to attend. Um, so if you're curious as to what goes on at our annual business meeting, I encourage you to stop on by. At this time, you can open that app and pull up the message notes. Pastor Michael's going to be bringing us our message today. I don't see anybody opening the app. What is, okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Good morning. Are you well? I just want you to know, if I was leading that members meeting, I'd have Don wear a powdered wig. <laughs> Which is why I don't lead them. Because I'm immature. And every time I'm in that meeting, I think of powdered wigs and gavels. Which is silly. But I do. And I'm just being real with y'all. I'm excited for this morning. I'm so excited for this morning. I'm excited for church. I'm excited to be with you. I'm excited for what God is doing in our church as we're celebrating 10 baptisms that took place last week. Y'all, that's cause and reason to celebrate. <laughs> Seriously. God's doing something here, and I'm excited. I'm excited to see you all here. I mean, look around this room right now. This is church. 
this is, we're here together as a community to represent to the world a different kind of existence, and that's exciting. And we're starting a new series today. We are out of the Old Testament as we've been following, really, just from a, a, a pretty high level, following through the Old Testament and the whole narrative of the scriptures. Like, what is the Bible really all about? And so we've been tracing a, a thread, a line through the entirety of the scriptures, and we're through the Old Testament, and today we enter into the new as we talk about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. I love that's the name of this series, just simply Jesus, and I love that. It's incredible. And actually, if you haven't noticed, I just want to take a moment to shout out uh, a couple of people whom I love very, very much. I love uh, just the people at our church and the different gift sets and passions that are represented, represented in our, uh, represented, yeah, there we go. I was like, what's that word? It's a common one. It's going to be a long morning. Hang in there. Stay with me. Uh, we have different passions and skill sets and gifts represented in our community, one of which is art. So Bryce Sullivan, for instance, a graphic designer, Casey, who's our children's director here at the Mills, who's awesome, her husband, Bryce, yeah, I mean, he designed this, which is just awesome. And if you walk out into our lobby area and in the hallway, you'll notice this picture. Let's show it up on the screen here. And that was actually illustrated, as have every uh, story series that we've had. Every one of those pictures has been illustrated in-house by Rich Kelly, who is just awesome and is hired by a lot of really big and awesome people like Netflix and Marvel and like all kinds. I mean, in our church, pretty cool. And he is offering that gift up to the Lord to design and illustrate our series for us. Isn't that just so cool? I just I love that. And this I particularly like. Why? And this isn't even the sermon. I've got a lot to talk about, too. It's also Communion Sunday, so it's just going to be a great morning. But in Genesis 3.15, the very beginning of the story, when sin enters the world, went through the temptation of Adam and Eve and the serpent, Satan, the enemy, tempts Eve to eat of the tree, and Adam and Eve eat. It's at that moment in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the first glimmer of the gospel emerges. The gospel meaning the good news of God. And it was a promise that he will, speaking to the serpent, the text says, Genesis 3, 15, he will crush your head, which is intense but also appropriate for the enemy, the Satan. And so I kind of love that this picture depicts the cross just over the serpent because that's the promise of the scriptures and of God that although evil and sin and darkness and destruction and pain and sorrow and sickness has entered into this world, there is a God who is at work to conquer it, and he has conquered it. His name, the conqueror, is Jesus. His name's Jesus. It's as simple as that. And so here we are in part one of Jesus. And it's true that in the scriptures and for all of humanity, it's the world's story. It's humanity's story that in the scriptures from the Old Testament to the New, we have uh, this kind of framework of there's creation and then there's the fall where sin entered the world, the effects of which we still feel very profoundly and strongly here today, especially as we look at the war across the oceans and the Ukraine and Russia and how that's all just deeply felt among the world here today. Those are the, the kind of war and hatred and injustice and bloodshed and pain and tear. That's, uh, those are all indicative of this fall that has occurred. The sin has entered the world. So we have creation, and God created things as good, and then there's this fall of people rebelling against God and his ways. But then we see very early on in the scriptures that God is quick to act. He's quick to act and to reverse and to rescue and to redeem and to help and to save humanity. Starting with Abraham, for instance, he, he gets a particular people group and makes a covenant with them, saying, I will be your God. 
I will rescue you from this mess. I'm going to pull you out of this world to exist as a different kind of people, a different kind of nation. You're going to be my people. And so we have creation, fall, rescue. And that scope, which started with Abraham, has now been extended and made available to all people for all time. That there's a door that has been opened that humanity, if you are sick and tired of sin and the effects of sin in this world, there is an open door relationship made available by Jesus for all who would trust in him as Lord and Savior to enter into the family of God. This great rescue, creation, fall, rescue, and ultimately God promises in his word that he is going to reverse the effects of sin once and for all in the new heaven and the new earth, that there will come a time in history where God is going to rid the world of all evil and suffering and the world is going to be remade and it's going to be good and there will be no more weeping. There will be godliness and justice and peace and goodness and righteousness. That's the whole of the scriptures. Creation, fall, rescue, reversal. That's the entirety of the scriptures. And so here we have Jesus. And as we can see, and I hope has been demonstrated throughout the course of our year together in the Old Testament up until this point, everything points to Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. That there comes now this moment, however, in the New Testament, where I love has, how one theologian described it this way, where God punches a hole through the heavens and comes to earth. Isn't that just beautiful? In the midst of the darkness and the sin and the suffering, there's this moment in history where God punches a hole through the heavens and comes to earth. And why is it that Jesus came to earth? Well, it was to bring God and humanity back together to create a bridge where humanity and God can come back together. Why? Because it was in Genesis chapter 3 where there was this great divorce, this great separation when sin entered the world. When people went their own way, sin entered the world and thus were alienated from God, separated from God. And when you're separated from God, it's there that the effects of sin are so devastating and so prevalent because God is fully just. He's fully good. He's full in his love. He's full in his kindness. He's full in his grace and his mercy. And so the further you get away from God, the further you get away from goodness, the further you get away from righteousness, the further you get away from peace and love as God has intended us as people to experience this world. And so a world that's far from God is a world that will be experiencing havoc and evil and suffering and injustice. And so Jesus entered to bring humanity and God together. And y'all, listen, when humanity and God are together, when a person is restored in relationship with God, both personally and corporately, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's in that relationship where it's like, oh, things are right again. Things are right again within me when I am connected to God again. I love the way the psalmist said it in Psalm 84, verse 10, talking about staying connected to God, being in the presence of God. Better is one day in your courts, speaking of God's courts, than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Oh, when we're connected to God, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. When you experience this proximity of relationship, connectedness with God, it is wonderful, it is beautiful, it's what our souls have craved to experience. I love the way St. Augustine said it when he said, Thou hast made us for thyself. O oh Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. If you find yourself in a state of restlessness here today, 
St. Augustine, he made this great claim and he shared this great experience that thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, that God has made us as people to live in relationship with him. And our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. So if you find yourself in a state of restlessness, may I submit to you, you need to find God because your heart was designed to experience relationship with him. Our world was designed to live in proximity to him. And it's when we go our own way that we experience uh, the life and the living that we were never designed to experience. And yet, Jesus did something about that. He bridged the gap. He created a way, a, a way for God and humanity to come back together. So what kind of rest exists for the human heart with Jesus? If it's true that St. Augustine said, our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee, what does that rest look like exactly? And so I would encourage you to turn in the scriptures to John chapter 1. We're going to move kind of quickly, but it's huge. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. If you don't know where that is in the scriptures, one you can find it real quick if you have like the app on your phone because it just tells you where it is. Or you can just open up the paper Bible if you have one and go to the beginning reference section and find John. It's okay. I, I still do that with some Old Testament books. Judge me if you want. I don't care. So. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And real quick, Jesus is depicted here. And I'm just going to come out and say this real plainly. It speaks of the word, the word with a capital W. That's a, a designation, a name, a title given to Jesus. And it's a loaded term. One I could geek out on for probably a couple hours and talk to someone because it appeals to the Greeks of the time and speaks kind of philosophically of the logos, the divine logos, which is this divine reason. Philosophy was really big in antiquity in the time of Jesus. And there was this kind of pining after, what is the reason or the logic or behind life? Like, what's the reason for life? Why do we live? What's the logos for life? The word, so to speak. What's the point of all of this? And there's a big claim, philosophically speaking, in using of the word or the title of the word for Jesus, meaning Jesus is the reason. He's the logic in this life. Everything is about him. Everything has come through him and is for him. It's a really big, grand claim. But it also is God's word. God's word from the very beginning. In the beginning, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he spoke. His word created. He revealed himself. And so here we see in Jesus, with this title of the word, that this is the scriptures and God saying, this is my final superior message going into the world. You can look at Jesus and see that this is the message of God, this Jesus, the revelation of God, the self-expression of God, the supreme and final message of God is Jesus. He is the reason. He is the logic for all things. That's the beginning of the title, the word. So I just wanted that to just be bouncing around ping pong style in the mind when reading John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And so I do want to read it in full briefly before we kind of look into what kind of rest exists for the human heart with Jesus. Are you all ready? This is big. This is real big. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. I just want to read it in its entirety. I just want you to let it soak in. In the beginning was the Word, meaning Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. 
The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. That's John chapter one, verses one through 14. There's a lot in there. I just want to say there's a lot in there. But there's at least four things in there, four things that stood out to me, something that I have titled this message, the reason why I've titled this message, Four C's, the four C's. When I read this text, I see that available for the Christian life, for the one who would call on Jesus as Lord and Savior, there is confidence, comfort, closure, and calling. Confidence, comfort, closure, and calling. So speaking of Jesus, let's start with confidence. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, meaning Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word, what? Was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Here's the thing about John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. If any part of John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14 is incorrect or not true, then literally what we're doing here in this mall makes no sense. Seriously. Churches and churches everywhere, the messages of Jesus, it all is pointless if the truth of John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14 is not true. And there are some pretty grand claims and mysterious claims in this text. For instance, the word, Jesus, was God. So right there at the beginning, we see Jesus is fully God. And this is supposed to translate to the Christian life as confidence. It's supposed to bring confidence. Why? Because I believe here in our culture and our time in which we live, I think there's a common question or yearning within us as people, our lives, the question who can I really trust? I believe more than ever in our culture and in our world, there is distrust like there has never been before. There's news flying at us. There's opinions flying at us. And I, I believe one of the first questions we probably ask is, is this true? Is this actually true? Isn't it amazing? Something could be plastered as a news headline and you're like, not sure. Don't know if I trust it. Distrust has gone rampant in our society, in our own lives. Who can I really trust? At its surface level, it's kind of we giggle, you know, at the thought of news being untrustworthy, not trustworthy. But it, it can lead to a real struggle for a human life. Like, who can I actually trust? Is there anyone I, who I can trust? And there's so much distrust that what we end up doing is just reverting back to ourselves. I become the standard of trust. I can only trust me. I can only trust my opinion. I can only trust my feelings. Y'all, I've got to tell you something. I'm glad that we have a God who we can trust. You can have confidence in Jesus. I'm going to talk personally here for a moment. I'm glad that I am not the only standard of truth for my life. Why? I'm not trustworthy. I'm just being honest. Like, right now, my body would be covered in all kinds of tattoos that I thought would be awesome when I was 18. I'm being, this is a really silly example, but this is what I'm talking about. But, like, had I trusted myself, <laughs> I'm telling you, I would have, I wish I could tell you, some tattoo ideas that I have. It's like, that'd be so cool. <laughs> Massive lion. If you have a tattoo of a lion, I'm not knocking you. I'm just saying it's not right for me. 
I ended up with one tattoo, and I was like, uh, I don't, people ask me, do you regret it? And I say, no, but I don't know that I would do it again. And somehow it's a fine line, but I live with it. I use it to illustrate, we change. Our opinions change. And so me being a standard of truth for my own life, I, I'm not too excited about that. Why? Because I've actually learned as I've gotten older that I change too much. I want something a little less chaotic than that. And yet there's this God who makes this claim in John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. That there exists objective truth. And it's validated in Jesus. Why? Because he's fully God. And so I can live confidently in his truth. I can live confidently in his way. His truth is authentic. It's valid. It's real. And that word truth, it also is associated with faithfulness and consistency, meaning it won't change. He won't change. His way won't change. When he says it's going to be this destination, that path that he has laid forward, it will arrive at that destination. We can place our confidence in him and his truth. Why? Because Jesus is fully God. What confidence exists for your life? I would submit to you there is a confidence in God. You must turn to him. Confidence. John chapter 1, 14, it says this. The word became flesh. Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. This is inherently mysterious. We don't have a category for this in our minds as people. Why? Because Jesus is fully God. Jesus, the word was God, but it also says that the word became flesh. Jesus is fully God, and we can have a confidence in him as such, as God and his truth and his way for our lives. But Jesus is also fully man. Fully God and fully man. Again, if you tinker with either side of this equation of this coin of Jesus, all of the scriptures and the promises and the goodness of God and the gospel, it all goes away down the toilet. And various aspects of this equation have been tinkered with over the course of human history. And yet Christianity has confessed for thousands of years now that Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. And what C, there's four C's, confidence. What C is there in knowing that Jesus is fully man? It leads to a comfort, a real comfort. Why? Because it's very easy in this world to live our lives and ask the question, who actually understands me? Who gets me? Isn't it easy to kind of exist in a vacuum sometimes? It's like, I feel like I'm just... I'm in a room full of people even here right now, but don't you sometimes just feel like an island sometimes? Who understands me? Who understands what I'm going through? Why do I have to be alone like this? Even the people who are closest to me, they don't feel that close. What about in times where we go through moments of difficulty or pain? It's like nobody understands me. I'm just dying inside of here. There's real comfort in knowing that Jesus is fully man. In Hebrews chapter 4, 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Meaning that Jesus was fully man, and he knows the full range of the human experience. He knows what it means to suffer more than any other person. He knows the mountaintops. He knows the valleys. He's not some distant God. He's not some removed God. The word became flesh. He stepped forward. He came close in proximity. God is personal. And not only is he personal, and not only was he a person and thus knows the human experience, but the scripture there says that he is full of grace and truth. We talked about the truth and the confidence that we can have in God and his truth. But God is also a God of grace. Do you know what that Greek word translates to? Loving kindness. Loving kindness. 
How many of us have this understanding of God as being loving and kind? He understands you. He understands you more than you understand yourself. He understands me more than I understand myself. And I can't even begin to tell you how much comfort that gives me. Because I feel those moments. I feel those moments where I feel like I'm uh, alone in this world filled with billions of people. And yet there is a God who knows me. There's a God who is personal. And he's loving. And he's kind. I know that there are all kinds of stories here in this place with all kinds of pasts, with all kinds of brokenness and experiences. Do you know that there's a God who knows you and he knows every single one of them? And maybe that makes you cringe in your seat, but you should know that he's full of grace, that he's loving and he is kind. He loves you. And he has come to rescue us. What comfort is there in knowing that there is a God who knows you and he loves you and he has a kindness for you and a kindness towards you? He has come to rescue us. He has come to forgive us. He has come to change us. He has come with love and kindness and he has come to pay our debt. That's why he punched a hole through the heavens and came to this earth. Because we as people were stuck in our sins, stuck in our separation from God. And there was a debt to be paid because of that sin, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus came to serve that death sentence that we deserved because of our sin. He came to pay that debt which has been owed. That's why Jesus came. And he did. He died on a cross and he rose from the grave. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he did it in loving kindness for you and for me to build a bridge so that we can enter into relationship with God again. That which has been broken in Genesis chapter 3 is able to be restored with Jesus. Did you see this amazing claim within the scriptures in John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13? It says this, the True light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world, speaking about Jesus. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And this is huge here today, church. You have to hear this news here today. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who received Jesus, this fully God, fully man, Jesus. To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Jesus is fully God, which leads us to a confidence in him and his way and his truth. Jesus is fully man, which leads us to a comfort in his loving kindness, the fact that he is personal and he understands. But Jesus, he also restores the broken relationship. And this should lead to real closure for our lives. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where sin entered the world and humanity was separated from God, the great broken relationship. It was there that Jesus then entered into this world to fix and to mend and to restore that broken relationship. And there is a promise that says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God has raised him for the dead, the fact that we were deserving of death because of our sin and that Jesus punched a hole through the heavens and entered this earth to die that death for us, to pay that debt for us, if we trust in him as our savior, as our rescuer, as our redeemer, if we believe in his name, then he gave the right to become children of God. A child of God. Do you, that's restored relationship. I find that so many people walk around with this overwhelming guilt and shame because of broken pasts or even just broken weekends. But Jesus did something some 2,000 years ago to provide a way for forgiveness. 
to give you a status, not as broken and worthless and guilty, but to give a status of child of God, loved by God, forgiven, redeemed, given life and life eternal. It is sure it should lead to a real closure for your life. If you feel that you are worthless in this world, you should have closure in knowing that God loved you so much that he died for you. And he wants to change your life. And he wants to bring closure to the matter. If you trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, your status is settled. Sins, both past, present, and future, are covered. The matter is settled. You're a child of God. You are to be released from all of that that is you're harboring even about yourself. Those things that people have labeled you. The labels people have put on you. Messed up, broken, irredeemable. The matter is settled with God. There is closure in knowing that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are a child of God. Restored in relationship. I'm tired of seeing people getting beaten down. I don't have a message other than the one that's given to me, which is if you believe in Jesus, then you're a child of God, and that's closure. Case closed. Settled. Done. What an amazing news it is for the human life. Can you see that there's a confidence, there's a comfort, and there's a closure that exists? All three of those words so absent in this world of darkness, is it not? But it exists with Jesus. It's an essential and beautiful and powerful truth, these seas for the human heart, confidence, comfort, and closure. But it's one that requires revelation. What do I mean? The fact that there is this confidence and comfort and closure in Jesus, it requires requires revelation. It needs to be revealed. We don't just intuitively know this as people. It needs witnesses. It's news that needs to be shared. You know, I found it very odd in this text if you look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, which we just read. It's paragraph, 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 four. It's easy counting. Here's what's interesting. Paragraph one talks about Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Nothing was made which has been made through him, and it was made because of him made Jesus' word. And then really randomly inserted in there, there was a man who was sent from God. So we're talking about Jesus, the word, and then it talks about John the Baptist, all randomly just put in there. There's the existence of Jesus, and then there's this man talked about here. There was a man sent from God whose name, we could throw it up on the screen. This is John chapter 1, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, John the Baptist, who was to prepare the way for the Lord to witness to this Jesus. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a what? Witness to the light. It was essential that in this revelation of God that there was a person that was inserted into the mix. That there was a witness inserted into the mix. And that's what Jesus does. Jesus utilizes people to witness. And this is the calling for the Christian life. The fact that there is this confidence, the fact that there is this comfort, the fact that there is this closure for the world, this is the calling for your life. When people are clamoring around looking for solutions and they're only hitting dead end after dead end after dead end, God has equipped his church, those who call on him as Lord and Savior, to actually carry the message and the solution the world is so desperate to hear. The fact that there is confidence and truth in a way forward that will lead to life and life eternal and justice and goodness and righteousness and godliness and love and kindness and gentleness and patience and 
self-control, that there is a real confidence in the way of Jesus, the fact that there is a loving kindness, a God who knows you and understands you, who has entered into humanity for you, who died in, on a cross for you, the fact that you can live securely knowing that your sins are forgiven, that you are remade, that you are a child of God, that this is the calling for the Christian life, that we get to bear this witness into this dark world. How glorious, how wonderful. I don't know if you know the calling God has on your life. I find that people understand their calling in existence in this life. They see themselves and their purpose to be about this big. Well, God has designed it that you would carry the message that will change the world message of Jesus. And so may you be encouraged here today, church, with Jesus, capital J-E-S-U-S, Jesus, comes confidence, comfort, closure, and calling. I find that as a Christian, no matter how close I get to God, there is always an area in my life where I can grow either in confidence in comfort, in closure, or calling. I don't know, but so many people here in this place today, where do you need to experience God in your life here today? Do you need to take a step forward in confidence in his truth and his way? But the world is telling me something different. My own intuition is telling me something different. No, no, God, he was, <laughs> Jesus was fully God. You have confidence in him. I need to grow in confidence. How many of you here in this place, you feel alone, you feel ostracized, you feel that your world is so harsh and cold? Do you need to experience God and the comfort that he provides? What about you who's battling this inner turmoil of, you know, I think I am broken, I think I am a mess, I think that I, I, I don't deserve much, I don't deserve a love of God, let alone anyone else, and so you need closure. I pray for closure for your life, that the matter would be settled, that you'd be able to just nestle into the truth of God and what he has for your life. And if you're here and you're like, I don't know why I exist. In fact, I wake up and I'm wondering, why am I even here? Why, God, if you exist, did you even give me breath in my lungs? I hope you would be encouraged in knowing that you've been given the greatest calling that has ever come to this earth to give the solution to the world's greatest problem, to give people Jesus. There is no other name under heaven by which people can be saved but the name of Jesus. And we've been given this honor, this calling to give people Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. You are fully God. You are fully man. You restore the broken relationship and you utilize people to witness. God, I pray you would help us to grow in confidence and comfort, closure and calling here in this place, that you would lift up the downtrodden here, you lift the head of those who have been beaten up in this world, that you would restore hope and power here in this place, that your church would rise to new levels. God, I pray for the person here who would maybe even step forward for the first time to say, Jesus, I'm trusting in you as my Lord and Savior. I need confidence in my life. I need comfort in my life. I need this closure. I need this calling. God, I pray that you would bring your people back to you here in this place, that you would show us by the power of your Holy Spirit, Spirit the area in which we need to grow here and take a step closer to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I would encourage you here in this moment, we're going to sing and worship God. And let's take a moment as we prepare to take communion together. Amy's going to come back forward in just a moment and walk us through communion together. And I would encourage you to hold these elements as we remember that this, this confidence, this comfort, this closure and this calling, it came at a very great cost. It took Jesus, God himself, dying for us as represented by these two elements. And so we're going to take a moment in reverence and worship to honor that here and remember together.
don't know about you, but I am so grateful that Jesus is now on the scene in our story. I don't know if you walked in this morning and you saw that and you were like, wow, we've been going through the story all year and Jesus has arrived. And thank you, Pastor Mike, for showing us how the four C's that he brings can change our life. As we prepare to take communion, I'm just so thankful for the cross and I'm so thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus has made on our behalf. I'm grateful because like Pastor Michael said, it changes how we look at our past and our sin. We are forgiven from our sins, past, present, and future. It also changes how we look at our eternity. We are secured because of his sacrifice. But I'm asking how does his sacrifice 2000 years ago change your here and now? What does the meaning of what he did mean to you today? And if you're a believer, Galatians 2.20, I believe sums it up pretty good. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Did you notice it says Christ lives in me? That is present tense, folks. That means that the creator of the universe, the one who punched a hole through to come to us, he resides in us. He takes up place in us. That is life-changing because that means I don't need to have my own toolbox of strength and power and peace and wisdom and understanding. That means that I can use his strength. He brings the four C's. He brings the wisdom. He brings all the things that I need to get through day by day. When Moses was confronted by God at the burning bush, and I won't tell you the whole story, but he asked God, who am I? God didn't answer him telling him about himself. God said, I am who I am. Because he reminds us that we shouldn't be looking at ourselves and what we can bring. We should be looking at the God we serve, the mighty God that we serve, and what he brings to our situations. We don't have to be bothered by our circumstances, our situations, even the uncertainty, even what's going on in the world, because the great I am, the one who can make all of it work together for your good and his glory, he lives in you today, right now. And so that should change everything. And I think about how our faith is strengthened by not getting everything that we need in advance. I am a very guilty person of this. I want control. I wanna know what's coming, when it's coming, how it's coming. And God in his divine sovereignty says, oh no, I will give you what you need day by day. I think of the Israelites and the manna. He could have given them a week, a month, a year's worth, but he didn't. He gave them one day at a time and that's what he does for us. He lives in us and he wants us to be dependent upon him every single day. If he were to give Amy Nichols enough to see down the road, I would begin to think I have control and that I'm in charge of my own situations, but he knows enough to say, I'll give you what you need each day. And if you're sitting right here and you don't have a communion cup because you haven't yet believed or you haven't yet received that amazing gift of salvation, I wanna tell you a very exciting piece of information. Deuteronomy says, if you seek him with your heart and your soul, you will find him. It's a guarantee. If you seek him, you will find him. And if you're sitting here and you're questioning, I'm not sure if I believe all this that's going on. I want to be available to you to pray. I'll be back in that corner. We're gonna sing, we're gonna do communion together. And while we're reflecting and praying, if you want to know more about this Jesus who came for you, who gave his bread, his body and his blood for you, I would love to pray with you and to, to just talk to you about that amazing gift. We all sit here, we sang about, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. And you can have that story too. In the book of Matthew, it says, during the meal, Jesus took and blessed the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. And it's with very grateful hearts that we remember the body of our savior today. Let's eat together. It goes on to say, then taking the cup and thanking God, he gave it to them saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood. God's new covenant poured out for many people 
for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Jesus, so much for this blood that covers. Let's drink together. Let's pray. God, we stand in awe of you. We stand in awe of the fact that the creator of all things would want us to have relationship with you. We stand in awe of the fact that you continue to reveal yourself to us. You continue to woo us and guide us and lead us. Help us not to ask who are we, but to ask who are you and to just stand in awe of your mighty power and your presence. God, we're so thankful for this time of remembrance. I thank you for the forgiveness that we have of our past, our sins, our mistakes, our shortcomings. And also I'm so grateful that we have an understanding of our future, our secure, eternal future because of you. But God, right here in this moment, I'm so full of gratitude because you take up residence in us. Because of your sacrifice, you sent your spirit and you live in us, all of the things that we need to make it through every day, you are bringing those just when we need. You have the wisdom to know just when we need, what we need, and when we need it. And we're grateful for that, God. Help us to cling to your promises. Help us to continue to seek you in every area of our lives to remember the sacrifice that you made so that we can be in right relationship, that we can be called a child of God. I pray for those who are seeking today that they would find your amazing gift of salvation and they would receive you. We thank you for this day in Jesus' name, amen. If you want to stand, we're going to worship.
blessed this morning? I hope so. Confidence, comfort, closure, calling, all found in who? Jesus. 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 May the truth of Jesus be a blessing to your life here in this place. And we're going to keep talking about Jesus, not only for this series, but for the whole of our church's existence. We're going to help people find and follow Jesus. So I hope you would join us next week as we continue in part two of You Knew It, You Know It, Jesus, Jesus. I want to invite you this week to stay reading God's Word. I want to invite you to read chapter 23 of the story and following this progression. That's a resource that we're using as a church that if you are jumping in now, it's not too late. You can buy this resource at the Connection Center. It's an abridged chronological Bible, more or less, and we're now into the New Testament talking about Jesus. I want to invite you to, to pick up that resource. It'll be a real blessing to your life. If you are wanting to step, take a step closer to Jesus. If you've never trusted in, in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we have a couple of resources intended to help you. One, Amy so graciously and awesomely invited you to go and talk to her. So she's in that corner. If you're wanting to learn more about Jesus, I would encourage you to talk to her. We also have a couple of resources designed to help you. They're available at either ends of the stage as well as at the tables near the exit of the sanctuary here. One's titled, He Did This Just For You. Talks more about what Jesus did on that cross for you and helping to pay, not helping, actually paying for the debt of your sin and mine, as well as first steps, learning to follow Jesus. And so it's just a real helpful resource as well as we'd love to outfit you and equip you with a paper Bible if you don't have one of those. I mean, we just want, you, want that to be a gift to you if you don't have one. This week, as we prepare to leave um, this place, uh, I pray that you would be able to live in confidence and comfort and closure and calling. And in that effort, too, we want to help this message reach the world. And so we have an initiative called Care for Kids starting up here where we partner with a children's home in Cambodia. These are brothers and sisters in Christ across the world in Cambodia. And so they're in need of some various project repairs um, for their children's home. And so we take up an offering and generosity to help them. And so all of the information for Care for Kids for this year is located in our Riverside Community Church app in the events section. I would encourage you to look at that. And so as we prepare to give today, I want to say thank you so much for your giving and your faithfulness. It's how we can literally keep the lights on, um, as well as help the message of Jesus get all over to children, young adults and adults, and we're in that together, testified and witnessed by last week, 10 people baptized at our church, and that is wonderful, and we're doing that together, so thank you so much for your faithfulness. I want to pray for you as we prepare to leave from this place and enjoy that beautiful weather. It's a little rainy, but warm out there waiting for you. Oh, yeah, okay, I'll tell you two more things after we're done. Let me pray. God, thank you so much. We love you. We thank you that we can live in confidence and comfort and closure and calling. God, I pray that you would help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to live in you, God, and who you are this week. God, I pray for these offerings, both for caring for our brothers and sisters in Cambodia, as well as for our church house here, God. I pray for the giver. I pray that you would bless them in stepping forward in faithfulness, maybe for the person here even who's going to step forward in this realm of faithfulness, of tithing, giving 10%, God, of their income to you as you've commanded. God, I pray that you would bless them for that faithfulness, for that obedience, that your word would not return void, but that you would bless them as they are obedient in the area of finances with you, God. And above and beyond, God, I pray that you would help these resources go and help people find and follow you, not only here in our neck of the woods in Pittsburgh, but around the world. And so Holy Spirit, be with my church family as they leave this place here today to do all that you have called them to do, to live confidently in comfort and closure. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Two things real fast. If you could take a moment and grab the, your receptacle and toss it on the way out, uh, that would be awesome. And don't forget, next week we are springing forward. So uh, losing an hour of sleep, that's sad, but we're gaining sunlight, so worth it. We're people of the light, so we should love that. So love you all. Hope to see you next week. Part two, Jesus. Love you. Take care.